it is really, I think, the essence of imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. And while you're turning there, let me say that at the conclusion of our service, we'll do two things today. We'll hear a report from Brother Barry Morgan over the first six months of, of our budget year. We'll also uh, take action. You, we had a wonderful discussion last Sunday night. We uh, sent out some notice about that uh, this week. We'll take action in the form of a vote. According to our Constitution and bylaws, all who uh, to be a, a member in good standing, it means that you are regular in attendance and regular in giving to the work of the ministry here. So uh, we'll be taking that matter up at the end of the service. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. You'll recall that we looked at the need for evangelical humility in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 13, as he continued, Paul continued to drive this matter of uh, pride that was manifesting itself in the church at Corinth in terms of choosing one preacher over another preacher rather than rather than lashing yourself to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever the mouthpiece might be. So Paul is doing something of a transition here. He's calling upon the Corinthians to imitate him. And then he's going to move into a topic in chapter 5 that will make what he's discussed thus far seem like child's play. The matter of Redemptive, corrective church discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. I want you to stand with me if you found that in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. Follow along as I read. I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Interesting words from the Apostle Paul, and yet he does so with the full authority and approval of Jesus Christ, in whose name he ministers, and under whose authority he conducts the work of the ministry. We've just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to take this to heart today. And I want you to put yourselves in the spot of the Corinthian church. And this letter is being read in your presence in the context of worship. I want you to respond to the apostolic authority of Paul under the Lordship of Christ and ask yourselves, am I taking seriously the admonition, the exhortation, the command really to imitate that authority, that model as a means to imitate Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. It's been said, you've heard this, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I would say that when it comes to the New Testament teaching and when it comes to being a follower of Jesus Christ, that imitation of him 
is one of the sincerest forms of authenticity of one being a follower of Jesus Christ. I've told you before in the past that when you, when you talk about being a disciple, a disciple maker, there's, there's three primary word groupings. We won't go into these today. I've, I've done this in the past, but just to remind you, there is that word disciple, in the, which in the New Testament is, is the word student. There is the word follower, which comes in different forms, and it talks about following to the end. And then there's this word imitate. If you and I could see the original word for this in the Greek, for the verb and the noun, uh, it, it looks like the word mimic. And in the noun form, that's what it means, it's to mimic. So it's one of those words, again, that, that hasn't necessarily been uh, translated into our English, but it's been transliterated. It's taken the form, the sound that it had in the Greek language and equivalent sounds spelled out in the English language. To mimic. It speaks of mimicking the, imitating the conduct of missionaries, the faith of spiritual guides, to imitate, mimic that which is good. When it occurs in the New Testament, it's always in the form of an exhortation. It's not a suggestion. You might want to try, no, it's not, you might want to try this. It's an exhortation, a strong exhortation to mimic. And Paul uses this. In fact, this idea, think about this, this holds a prominent place in the writings of Paul. If you take the 13 documents in the New Testament that are attributed to him, six of those have this idea presented in them. Six of them. And I just want to just do a real quick uh, survey of where this word shows up in the writings of Paul, and then there's one uh, in the writings of in, in 3 John. Just real quickly, just let's run through the scriptures to see these. I want you to eyeball these. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, which we'll be coming to in our study of 1 Corinthians, in a, in a portion that actually belongs uh, to the end of chapter 10. It's, it's, when we get there, we'll show you it's a very poor break in our chapter headings. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In other words, follow me as I follow Christ. It's the, it's the, it's the parameter. It's the gospel parameter. There's, uh, you know some preachers that are heavy-handed and they just demand that you follow them. Uh, I know parents like that. No, no, no. The context of following, of imitating, is to the extent that what you're imitating is reflective of the teaching and example of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Paul says, therefore, as he's... He's, he's written this in chapters 1 through 3, three these strong declarations of, of our salvation. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. What that means for him here is walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In Philippians 3, verses 17 to 21, brothers, he says, join together. So now, this is a thing where he's saying, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting form of the word imitate. It means imitate together. So don't think of yourself as a, as a lone ranger here. Imitate together. Join with me in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you with tears, and he's talking about people who profess to be Christians here, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. That, that is shocking if you just... The idea that a person who professes to be a Christian lives as an enemy of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things in himself. Join together in, in imitating that example and reject the example of those who are enemies of the cross, even though they would name the name of Jesus on their lips. 1 Thessalonians 1, 
2 to 10, he says, we, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before God and, our fa and Father, your work of faith, your labor of love, the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he's chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not in, only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. You said that, that, that connection again, like 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Imitators of, of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia. Okay, I want, I want you to see, this is, the, this is the movement of discipleship. Paul the disciple maker, as you became imitators of us and of the Lord. And then you became an example yourself. So Paul the disciple maker was engaged in disciple making, and those who were on the receiving, effectuate end of his disciple making, themselves were modeling this example as disciple makers. That's the continuum of the Christian life. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded, this is verse 8, sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. That, every time I read this in 1 Thessalonians, I just think, oh, dear God, I want that to be true of me. I want that to be true of the brothers and sisters that I, that I live and labor with at Bethel. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. Now he's writing this to Thessalonica. He can't say that to Corinth. Because people in Corinth are bad-mouthing him. People in Corinth are playing Peter and Apollos and Paul off of one another. But listen what he can say about Thessalonica for all of its other headache problems. They talk about the reception that we had among you, how you, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Then again, in that same letter to Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God. The Lord Paul says, this, this is what we find. Everywhere that people are saved, this is what we find. They receive the Word of God for what it is, the Word of God, not the Word of men. The churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. He says, no different. When, when, when Jews receive the gospel and become followers of Christ, then their Jewish context persecutes them. When Gentiles receive the gospel, become followers of Christ, then their Gentile context persecutes them. There's, there's, there's a common thread here. We're reading about it every Wednesday night, and we pray about it every Sunday morning. Brothers and sisters around the world who turn their backs on their culture and follow Jesus Christ and face persecution. Why? Because they are imitators of God, imitators of Christ, imitators of, of the apostles and the apostolic message. They said he, they killed both the Lord Jesus. The Jews killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. And they displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles in order that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins. It's very interesting. But wrath has come upon them at last. So Paul's thinking about something there where, where there's actually been. Remember this, this group of folks that took an oath? They swore not to ever eat again until they've had... Paul's head on a platter for, for betraying the Jews. Apparently something's happened to folks like that. And Paul says, wrath's come upon them, judgment's come upon them. And again in 2 Thessalonians, another letter, verse, chapter 3, verses 6 to 12. Look over there. He says, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord. We read this earlier, remember? with the tradition that you receive from us. I'll just pick out a couple of verses here. We've already read it. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. And then drop down in verse 9. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you and ourselves an example to imitate. 
And he talks about something that's on the, on the, on the theme of discipline, how you do not uh, approve of those who live lives that are scandalous. We'll be dealing more with that in the coming days. Hebrews 6, 9 to 12. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Remember, he had just talked about the danger of falling away, that it's impossible to be renewed. He says, though we speak about these things, we're confident of, of better things in you, things that accompany salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you've shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So that, look at this, you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Follow the example. Mimic those who are persevering through difficulty. Hebrews 13, 7 to 16, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And he talks about Jesus Christ. This is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Don't be led astray by diverse and strange teachings, for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. And he talks about this altar that doesn't involve sacrificing physical animals. Uh, it's, the, it's the altar uh, of Jesus Christ. And so he goes on and discusses that. Then 3 John 11 and 12. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever practices good is from God. Whoever practices evil has not seen God. It's very similar language in John chapter 3. Unless you're born again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you will not see the kingdom of God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. This is, this is just a brief survey of, the, of this influence of the idea of, of being an imitator, of mimicking. And you see it. Uh, the, the bulletin cover had a sense of that today. I, there was a little boy when I was uh, pastoring in Clinton, Louisiana. He took a liking to me. And... Uh, his parents came to me one time and they said, we can't get him to do his homework. He, he just, he, he's, he's stubborn. He, he, he's, he just uh, turned out to be one of Josh and Jason's dear friends. And, and so I said, well, send him by after school. I just talked with him. So I sat down and talked with him. He did his, did his homework right there in front of me. Just, and it was one of those interesting arrangements. And so the next thing I know, he starts saying to his mom and dad, I want to wear a, can I wear a coat and tie to church? Now, this was a huge change for this, this boy. Oh. Well, Sure, I mean, why? I want to look like Brother Bill. Be like Brother Bill. And so there was a season that he went through where he was, he was imitating me. And it was, a, it was a season where I was able to have wonderful influence on his life in a positive way to encourage him to, to embrace the fifth commandment wholeheartedly, to honor his father and his mother, and, and, he, and he did that. Uh, he's married today and has a sweet, sweet family. So we've seen that. We've seen that. Josh said it a while ago. Somebody's watching. Somebody's following. The question is, where am I leading them? Am I leading them to, to do their own thing, go their own way, or am I leading them to the cross? You, what do your children see that you value? Well, let's look at this passage just, just real briefly today. I want to see these things. First of all, the importance of receiving apostolic correction. Second, the importance of being imitators of the apostles. Third, the importance of recognizing apostolic authority. It's right here in this passage because Paul is he's laying this down as a, as a basis for why he has said what he has said, but he's also getting them ready because he's going to say something in chapter 5 where he says, I'm not there with you, but as if I was with you, I've already handed this one over to Satan. And I expect you to do the same thing to this fellow who is in gross immorality in the church. So in the middle of this, he asserts, his apostolic authority. Look at number one, the importance of receiving apostolic correction. I do not write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Sometimes it's necessary to be stern with, with a gospel tone and a true love of Christ. Nobody likes to do that. No pastor likes to do it. I'd run as far as I could run from a fellow who's, who's flaunting his 
uh, his credentials. But every now and then, when someone steps up and becomes arrogant and haughty, and Paul is dealing with this here at Corinth, he said, what I've, what I've written to you, what you've read thus far, because you can imagine, put yourself in Corinth. He said some things without calling names, but the people on the receiving end of this letter, hearing it, some of them are fuming. They're getting steamed. And at that point, Apostle says, you're going to have to decide whether you believe my motives or not. Because here's, what the, here's one of the devil's masterful tools to get people to assert bad motives, believing the worst. And I can tell you, 40 years of pastoring, uh, I've been on the receiving end of that an awful lot. Sometimes, in the occasion presented itself, I would say to the person, well, thank you for believing the worst then. Practicing the exact opposite of what the Scripture says. And Paul is heading off some of this. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. They've either got to believe him at that point or they don't. They've got to say, oh, Paul loves, by the way, the false apostles, the super apostles in 2 Corinthians he's talking about. They say, ah, oh, Paul does this. When he's, he's not there, when he writes, man, he is bold as a lion. But when he shows up, he's timid. He backs off. Talks a good game when he writes, but nothing to him. Paper tiger. This is what he was dealing with in terms of the accusations leveled toward him. You're going to pick up on that toward the end of this passage. I do not write these things to make you ashamed. I haven't done this just to humiliate you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. He says, I'm treating you in a fatherly way. And if you're a father, you know that that's one of the accusations that's hurled at fathers all the time. It's you just... You just don't want me to have any fun. You're just a cosmic killjoy. Well, I can say as I've said to children, now I say it to grandchildren, no, I do it because I love you. If I didn't love you, I wouldn't care. If I didn't love you, I'd say, go, go do whatever you want to do. Get, just get out of my hair. Don't bother me. No. I do it because I love you. And Paul's using that argument with them. You've got to receive it, though. The Proverbs has a lot to say about what a wise person looks like and what a fool looks like. And one of the things a fool looks like is a fool hates correction. A fool hates being called to account. Wise people, no, nobody enjoys it, but wise people learn to embrace it and believe the proverb that says, the wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So Paul is giving this correction, and it's important. It's a, it's a part of the package. We're going to talk about this more, but... The, let me just say that part of the problem with the education system in America today, there's several problems, but one of them is that educators' hands are tied. All they're allowed to do is to formally teach. They're not allowed to bring correction. And teaching is both, both instruction and correction. When you take one away, you can't have education. So it's important to recognize that this is a part of the gospel process. That's what Paul says to Timothy that the word of God is profitable for it, remember? Secondly, the importance of being imitators of the apostles. He says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, and that's kind of, that's an amazing statement when you think about it. Corinth had not been in existence that long. Yet the church at Corinth, with all of its problems, had people growing in grace so that Paul could say to them, you have countless guides. There are plenty of people in Corinth who will lead you in the way of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty good thing to say. I would, would pray that every church... Pray that our church can be marked that way. You can point to most anybody and say, well, follow that person. They're following Christ. You do not have many fathers. He's speaking about here the, the precious privilege he had, being used by God as he preached the gospel, attended by the Spirit, to birth these people into the kingdom of God. They were saved by grace through faith through his influence. So he says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Forget this party spirit, Peter, Apollos, Paul. Mimic me. I was with you 18 months. You should have picked up something of the aroma of Christ that you could latch hold of. In fact, that's why I sent Timothy, my beloved, faithful child in the Lord. Another one that God had, 
and used Paul in his life to bring him to faith in Christ with the, with the help of the childhood instruction of his mom and his grandma. I sent Timothy to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Timothy came in with a specific mission. To remind the church at Corinth, you know that Paul taught against that. You know that Paul exhorted you to this. To remind them. We have an enemy of our souls, brothers and sisters. You need to know this. I'm not a very good preacher, but we're reading a lot of scripture here. And when you walk out of here today, one of the things the enemy of our souls wants you to do is to forget what you have heard. To file it away. To let the cares of life fill your mind so much. Another thing he will do, by the way, you need to know this just while we're talking about it, is he will cause you to question me. Now in 13 years here, let me go ahead and say it. I've been called everything but a white man by former members, okay? I don't, my, my feelings are on my shoulder about that. Look, when the Lord called me to the ministry, uh, an old pastor said to me, you better have the heart of Lottie Moon and the hide of a rhinoceros if you're gonna make any difference in gospel ministry. So I'll try to keep that in, in close to my, my chest all these years. You see, the devil's gonna, gonna why? Why would he do that? Why would he, why would he try to assassinate the character of the, of the preacher? Shoot the messenger? What? Destroy the message. You've got to know that. And I don't say that to you so you'll, you'll fawn all over me or admire me. I don't, I, don't, I don't look for that, don't need that, don't want that. What I'm telling you, though, is you've got to guard your hearts because when you walk out these doors, there's an enemy of our souls who wants to snatch up every bit of gospel seed that's been sown in your mind today. Paul knows that, too. So he said, I sent Timothy to remind you. And then he says this, the importance of recognizing apostolic authority. He says, some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. He knows, this has been told him, there's some there in Corinth, in the church, who said, look, he spent 18 months here, he's moved on, Paul's all about himself. Paul loves to go to different places and see things happen. He just, he loves to have it heaped on him. He's not coming back here, there's no value in him coming back here. That's what they were saying about him. But I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills, he recognizes it's all in God's hands. He, this is the apostle who said that he sought several times to go in a certain direction, and the Lord hindered him. He would not open the doors for him to go there. He recognizes that. He, he moves, he lives and moves and has his being under the sovereign authority of God, and according to the pleasure of God, for he knows that. I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. Here you're seeing this, this apostle with a, with a righteous indignation flaring up. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. Let me tell you something I've learned in 40 years of ministry. People who go around in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ sowing discord, gossiping, slandering, trying to undo, they're cowards. Okay? The cowards. How can you say that, Pastor? Because I can tell you that through the years, for 40 years, I've said, I want to sit down and talk with you face to face. No, I'll do it. The cowards. More than one occasion, I've said, tell you what we'll do. I had a fellow here years ago who accused me of being a part of, one of, the, of, the, of the new world order, advocating a one world government. Shocking to have that said of me, but when he lumped Billy Graham into that as well, I thought, well, I'm in fairly good company there. So, so we sat down in my office. He brought several men to accuse me. I sat down and listened to the whole thing. One of the brothers he brought, in the middle of the thing, turned around and said to him, said, this is, this is nonsense. I didn't know what you were bringing me for this. Here for. And so I, got, I said, tell what we're going to do. I said, this is what you allege is false. But we're going to go to the church. We're going to set these accusations before the church. And we're going to see. I'm, you're going to make your argument for my guilt. I'm going to defend myself. 
I'm going to show my innocence. And when the congregation sees that I am not a part of a movement to advocate a one world government in this church uh, and in league with the Antichrist, then they're going to clear me of your charges. But because you falsely charged a pastor, you will face discipline. Because you see, people have this notion. And you've had it in your history at Bethel and previous pastors that you can just say anything you want to say about a preacher and there are no consequences. Listen to what Paul is saying here. I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And that word power there speaks not only of the power of God, but the authority. So he says, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? Now he's playing off of this notion that he's a weak man. He says, I know how to come. He's already identified himself as a father to them, a father figure. And I can come into Corinth, and I can spiritually, in, in gospel context, spank you if I need to. Or with a love, with love and a spirit of gentleness. So, how shall I come? And basically what he said, and, you, and if you're a parent, you know this. I've said to my children through the years, we can make this easy, we can make this hard. I've said to children at youth camp, for 25 years, I can be your best friend, I can be your worst nightmare. It's up to you. How you conduct yourself will determine how this goes. That's what Paul's saying here. Shall I come to you with a rod? Because I will come in and call names and point out the people, these arrogant people at Corinth that are undermining. Now Paul didn't care about himself personally, but undermining the fruit of the ministry he was sowing there and had sown there. Or come in love and a spirit of gentleness. And the answer is, it depends on how you, the folks at Corinth, conduct yourselves in these matters. And then, folks, it's in that, with that question, that he launches into this tragedy that's going on in Corinth where a man is immorally involved with his father's wife. Either because his father had died and this is his biological mother or his stepmother. We don't know the relationship, but Paul uses language there that says what's happening there is incestuous. And rather than you being grieved and troubled and taking action on it, you have some foolish gospel notion that you love these people too much to judge them. And he calls that pride. And so here's, here's where we, we leave it. Shall I come to you with a rod? Or shall I come to you with gentleness? And the, it's a rhetorical question, but the answer is, it depends on how you conduct yourselves. And so it's critical for us today but we ask ourselves, am I following, am I imitating the authority and the example and the teaching of the apostles? Remember that, that, the, that the whole gospel enterprise is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Am I doing that? Am I leading people by my life and my words? Am I leading them to the cross? And they follow me, do, do they get the aroma of Christ? Do my children see that I'm in love with Jesus and I love what Jesus loved? Jesus Christ loved the church. Do my children see that in me or do they, do they see me as dating the church? Do they see me as using the church for my benefit but, but not recognizing that I have a covenant commitment responsibility? Do they see me engaging people, the neighbors, the neighborhood, in the marketplace, engage them in the gospel? Because they do listen. They do watch. And we can give them a list of what we say is valuable to us, but they listen and they watch and they know what is valuable to us. Paul says, imitate me as I strive to imitate Christ. There's an admonition there. There's qualifications there, 
But the bottom line is that we, I, you, must be committed daily to imitating this apostolic example. Because it points to the example of Jesus Christ. Perhaps one day we'll come back and preach on just how Christ is an example. But I can say that word and every one of you have in your mind. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give himself a ransom. He washed the feet of the disciples. He laid down his life. He obeyed his Father perfectly. He loved the church and gave himself you know, passage after passage of the example of Christ. So I call you to the gospel again today. Repenting of sin. Trusting in Christ. Wanting to grow more like Him. More in love with Him. Have His heart for the neighborhood and for the nations. We're to be imitators. Mimic. Peter said, Christ has left us an example. I've taught you that word before. He's left us a writing under. His life shows us how to make the ABCs of the gospel. And to live it out. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come today in Jesus' name, and we, uh, we see this passage. And Father, help us, not to, help us to really embrace apostolic authority, the, the authority that you gave the apostles. For our Jesus said that upon this rock I build my church, he gives the keys of the kingdom to those apostles. Help us to follow in their trail. To recognize that they lived for Jesus Christ. They died for Christ. Help us to live for him while we live. Be willing to die for him when we come to die. Help us to conduct our lives personally and then corporately as a congregation according to the, to the measure of Christ that what would be most important in this congregation would be your glory upon this congregation, the name of Jesus Christ upon this congregation, the well-being of the little lambs that you've placed among us and, and the call that that means for us to live as disciple-makers, committed to make disciple-makers. Help us so to conduct ourselves that, that the welfare of any believer and those who profess to be believers and go astray, that we, we conduct ourselves in such a way that we will be redemptive, never punitive, but redemptive. We thank you for the example of Paul, Apollos, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Titus, Timothy, Philemon, and a host of of others we learn about in your word. Help us to be numbered among them. May it be said of us, I followed his example because he followed Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.